sing. Let's do this. It's going to be awesome. Okay. What is so funny, I just have to say, and my girls from, let me just say this, um, all the girls from Shoreline Church, would you guys just stand up for a moment? Look at my beautiful girls. Okay, give them a hand because they're your cousins. You came to grandma's house and we're so excited to have you guys with us. Um, yeah, I am a mess, really, I am. Um, Eric and I, and some of our team were up in Gatlinburg um, this week planning our series for next year with our team. And um, he, draw, he took Robbie and I, Pastor Robbie. Robbie, hold, hold up your hand. She's a, this girl right here, she is hot stuff right there. Anyway, so Pastor Robbie and I got to travel down from Gatlinburg. We flew down. And um, this is no joke. On the way to the airport, it took, I think it was an hour, an hour drive, took me the, it took me the whole hour to organize my purse. Um, and, then, and then I realized in the process that I didn't have my ID. And you could just see my husband like. And Robbie, because she knows me so well, she's like, okay, did you, she's trying to be really calm. And, and no kidding, the women at East Coast Christian Center that have had to help me in the last day, especially this morning, <laughs> I mean, it takes like 10 people. I'm not even joking. Like, I, I'm, is that true? It's true, isn't it? Yep, just a little bit. Like, I get everything together at the last minute. You know, I had this message prepared a couple of weeks ago. It was this beautiful, long message. And then I tried to shorten it. And then I edited it again. And then talked to our teaching pastor this week. And he's like, no, 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 darling, this is a series. So um, <laughs> let's pull back on this just a little bit. And it, I can't even tell you, like, I just, it, it's the weirdest thing, but at the last minute, like, I feel so comfortable right now. And, um, yeah, like, I think we're going to just talk, and I want to catch up on life. And honestly, thank you, Pastor Jessica. Is she just amazing or what? God. She is so amazing. She is, she is a rock star, like, for me. I, she just, she's such a blessing to me. Um, but she, she, she told me that I could just kind of relax a little bit and share some stories with you guys and catch up because we really haven't had much of an opportunity to do that. Because when Eric comes and speaks here, they might say, and Darlene's here. And I go, hello, everyone. And that's all I get. So, um, <laughs> so I'm super pumped that I have a little bit of time um, to catch up this morning. So I think what I'm going to do is first off, thank you East Coast Christian Center for doing what you're doing. And thank you leaders for working so hard. I came here early this morning and they were praying over every seat. <laughs> so awesome. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We are going to, I wanna, I wanna update you, for those of you who know me, I wanna update you a little bit on life. And for those of you who don't know me, you're gonna get to see my crazy family. So here we go. Uh, I got a little slideshow for you. Look at that booty right there. It's actually really large right now. I'm gonna make it smaller though. This is my beautiful son, Harbor. Oh, he's so gorgeous, I love him. Some of you know him. When we started coming to East Coast, he was just a year old. And that is his beautiful wife, Caitlin, right there. She is definitely the girl we prayed for, for him his entire life. Like when the second I met her, he's so funny. He, he, um, he invited me to Jacksonville and we had lunch together. And, and when I met Caitlin for the first time and I was like, Okay, this is serious business. So I sat down and like in a minute, I was like, that's her. So then we walked out to the car. He was gonna hug me goodbye. And I just looked at him, I go, do not let that girl go. <laughs> so he was very excited about it. He was like, okay, mom. So anyway, so that is um, Harbor. That's my booty, but Harbor. <laughs> oh, this is Fisher. Isn't he the cutest thing ever? He just turned four. He's, he is just, oh my God, this makes me want to cry. Look at those cheeks. He's so precious. That's Fisher Parton. Yeah, he's four and hilarious and precocious, and he literally is the most intelligent child on the planet. I know that I'm a grandma, but seriously, he is, isn't he, you guys? He's really smart. They're all going to go, yes, Darlene, he is. Uh, he is. Okay, he's gorgeous. This is sweet Ezra. Ezra is like, sweet, tender heart, and he just loves people and food. He's just beautiful. Okay, who's next? 
my booty again. This is awesome. <laughs> this is like, this is, um, this is our sailboat. Some of you guys have been on it before, um, but this was in my, family's, in my family since I was 10 years old. And some of us, uh, Dorothy Mounts is in here, right? Girl. Dorothy, where are you? Oh, there she is. She helped us sail this boat around Florida. And we have some great stories. But anyway, we, 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 um, we sailed it around Florida from Destin to here. My dad gave it to us. And then we took it home during the whole year of the hurricanes. And now Harbor has restored it. And this is his business. This is what he does. He does charters on that. Oh, look how handsome he is again. Show that. I obviously think my children are beautiful. Why do we keep going back to this? Okay. <laughs> This is Harbor. Look how cute. This looks like a model picture. This is actually um, Sandy's daughter. Sandy Metcalf, who's here with me. She used to go to East Coast, too. She came to help us plant the church. This is her daughter, Mackenzie, who is a, an avid sailor as well, and sometimes cruise for him. Go ahead. Do we have to do this again? Okay, good, we don't. Uh, this is me and Harbor. Sometimes I crew for him, like when he needs extra crew and he gets a, a booking and he, he needs some extra help, so that's just us having some fun. This is my daughter, Michaela. She's fun. She is spunky, that one. She, um, she moved away the day after high school and moved to Indonesia and then lived a little bit in Australia and she was gone for 10 years. Wow. Yep, there she is, look at her. That's her business. Um, she sells coconuts, that's the logo, Wild, on there. She's brilliant, just a little entrepreneur, she's awesome. Keep going. This is Skiz. This is Skylar. Some of you might know Skylar. He's my wild child. I know. Laugh. Laugh. You love it, don't you, Jessica? Look at that. There's Sk Whoa, yeah. Waka waka. I don't think it's a waka waka thing at all. I, I, I seriously don't get it at all. It's like psychedelic weird stuff. Go ahead. That's John. Some of you might know John Rusnak, who um, he was a part of TNT and ended up coming to live with our family and became a part of our family when we planted the church. And so John and Skylar worked together quite a bit and they are just really interesting and fun. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, put that down. That's a surprise for later. Okay, so anyway, that's my family. Aren't they cute? They're colorful and fun. Yeah, so um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk a little bit about Destin, because some of you, it's so funny, when we would tell people that we were moving to Destin, some people would say, oh yeah, I think I've been through there before. And we'd say, no, 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 you have not been, you did not drive through Destin, because Destin is an hour from the interstate. So when you're going down I-10, and then you have to go down south to get to Destin, you, all you, you, it's just country and trees, and you're like, there, there's no way I'm heading to the beach, but you are. Um, so yeah, so we live in this beautiful city called Destin, and um, what else was I gonna tell you about that? Oh, it's a resort town. It's a completely different, it's just a completely different animal. And um, Eric and I both grew up there, and when it came time, we, they had this stirring in us about planting a church. Listen, we wanted to be youth pastors forever. And for those of you who know us, you know that's true. Like, I, I could have done it until, like, I died, seriously. But we, we really felt like God was wanting us to go home and start a chir church um, for the locals there because there is just a different kind of culture there that is it's hard to really explain. But the, um, the industry there is tourism. That is the main industry. And so everything caters to People who are coming on vacation, they have this idea, the ideal life of like what they're gonna do that week, and we have beautiful things to do, like um, obviously my children have incredible businesses. I, Harbor, Harbor, he, Harbor not only has his own res, uh, charter business, but he also works for a resort where he, he um, I, I'm, I can't think of my words. Shuttles, thank you. Again, like I hate to do this, but let's just be real here. And I, I talked about this a couple weeks ago with some of you sisterhood girls from East Coast. I'm going through menopause. <laughs> and I literally, like I can't believe that. I was 21 and I'm here. I, I feel so weird, I'm like, I, you kind of feel like that person that's gonna go through menopause is like an alien, somebody you don't. I'm never gonna be that person and now I'm that person. So I'm gonna forget words every once in a while. Sandy is here to cue me, we're good. Um, anyway, 
Shuttle, Harbor Shuttle, also Shuttles for a Resort. He's a captain in Shuttles for a Resort. But anyway, there's just lots of cool things to do there. There's this big, beautiful pirate ship where kids can go out and, and act like pirates, and there's wave runners and paddle boarding and just all kinds of beautiful things to do. So people come, and they have this ideal image in their mind of the vacation they're gonna have, and they're probably gonna get it because we're really good at what we do there in Destin. But for us as locals, we kind of have to learn to not live on vacation. Is that right, girls? <laughs> because it's so easy to just like jump right into vacation mode, but we actually have to work and do things. And so on Sundays, though, when we get done with church, we're completely like want to drop dead. Um, Eric and I will put our boat in the water and we will go out to near this place called Crab Island. And there's a lot of people that are just anchored on boats. It looks like a big swimming pool almost. But we don't get right in the middle of it because we've just been with people all morning. We get to watch it from afar, but we'll go over and we'll park our boat and we'll just swim and chat the entire afternoon. It's so much fun. And we'll just talk about all the things that God did at church and talk church strategy, and then we don't want to do that. And we'll just start talking about life and dreams and vacations and all of that. And it's so much fun. But inevitably, when we're a relaxing, we get to see this vacation world come alive. And um, there's this boat that will pull up beside us in that area every single Sunday. And it's a little bit off in the distance, but what happens is there's like families on this boat. It's, it's like a, uh, again, I can't think of, it's not a charter. Can you believe this? I, I don't have words. It's okay. Anyway. It's, a part, it's kind of a party boat. It's a shell and snorkeling boat. So they take these people out and they'll park and, and get off and these families will have buckets in their hands and snorkels and they'll spend about an hour usually just going around the boat in the shallow water picking up shells, like beautiful shells. And it's so fun for us to just sit there and watch them because we don't care. We don't care about the shells and all of that, but they're just collecting them. And an hour later, they will have a bucket full of shells and everybody's super happy and excited and they've taken their little photos and they get back on the boat and they leave and they might go somewhere else in the harbor or go out into the Gulf. And then we're just like, we watch them leave. We're like, oh. And then we go, God, I've never collected that many shells here. And I, how does that happen? These people come on vacation, they get all the great shells. And I'm like, I don't, I have, I probably have that many shells in a lifetime of living in that area. So um, I don't see them very often, but one of the things I do see, and they're everywhere, is oysters. Oysters are everywhere. Now, do you see the shell? This is beautiful. This is vacation land right here. This is what you go for. But for me, this is what was in my backyard. I'm serious. Like, it smells, it's, it's <laughs> actually just got shucked. Um, but yeah, there would be beds of them in, in our backyard and we would have to either walk through them if we wanted to get to the swimming area in the backyard or we'd have to walk out of the dock, get past the reef and, and then we could, we could swim there. But yeah, they're kind of like, like do you, mm, it's like dangling. Actually, there's probably some live things. This is alive. This is, this is like really, like some of this stuff's probably still alive in here. Um, it's really smelly, it's kind of muddy, it's not very pretty, but this, <laughs> this, <laughs> this is absolutely beautiful. Now, I want to tell you a story because oysters really are a big part of our culture, and, um, and we love to eat them. Anybody like raw oysters? Look at you guys, rocking. Okay, so I have this story. Um, we, love, we love oysters, and my daughter, because she was gone for so long and would only come back because she lived internationally maybe once or twice a year, and one year she came home for Christmas, and she has um, one of her best friends from high school is a model. She's stunning. And so she and Jordan decided they were going to kind of do the tourist thing. They were going to go out in these beautiful, you know, little black dresses. They were going to be very, very refined and just have a great night out. And so um, they left the house, and they were going to go to Marina Cafe. And I figured, you know, she's gonna be home soon or whatever, but about 10 o'clock at night, I get a text from Michaela, and she's like, Mom, we are having a blast. We ditched the whole Marina Cafe thing, and we had to go get some oysters. So this is what happened. You show me that beautiful picture of Michaela with the tambourine. <laughs> Boom! I mean, look at that, you can tell. Like, it, when your daughter sends you a picture like that, she's like, 
We are living it up. And what she told me was is that they had basically taken over this little restaurant called The Boathouse. It's this tiny little hole in the wall. It's kind of grungy and smelly. There's dirty um, dollar bills hanging all over the ceiling. Um, and, and there's really colorful people that are there, really, really colorful. It's not dangerous or anything. It's just colorful and kind of grungy and fun, hole in the wall. Um, but there's also, we can't really see them there, but there's probably about 100 bras hanging throughout the rafters. And I think what they are is they're like, like a memorial of sorts. <laughs> like, I had a great time tonight. <laughs> I'm gonna take this bra off and commemorate it. And then they hang it, it's, it's crazy. So it's just a fun place. Like actually, I know Sandy's family, um, Sandy and Matt and their kids, after the Christmas parade every year, they, they go there and it's a tradition for their family to go and, and have some oysters and hang out. So it's definitely a family place, but it's really colorful and you kind of never know what's gonna happen in that place. But you know what I thought would be so fun is if you guys could experience a little bit of that this morning. Would that be so fun? I want you to feel it. I want you to feel it because here's the thing. In Central Florida, you guys like, some of you guys don't even eat seafood. I'm so confused. And, um, and like where we are, like it's like you talk to your neighbor, they're like, I went fishing today, here's some snapper. Would you like some snapper? And you just cook it right up. Like it's what we do. And, uh, and we, eat, we eat lots of oysters and we play country music and we have a great time because we're right underneath Alabama. So I have asked Sandy if she would come up and help me She's gonna come up and help me. We're gonna give you guys a little feel of the boathouse. How does that sound? All right, Sandy, you gonna help me? Yeah. Where's our, where's our hats? I don't know. Ja oh, Jeannie. Where's Jeannie? Girl, you got some hats? Girl, we need some hats. We need some hats. Where is Amanda Saunders? Although I know that's not her last name right now. Girl, come on up here. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna have some raw oysters at 9.21 in the morning. We are gonna have raw oysters today. And um, she is a raw oyster virgin, and so we're gonna bring her up here. Yes, yes. And, but we have to get ready. We have to get ready. Did, oh, she went to get the hats, okay. Hey, we're family here, right? This doesn't have to be super programmed and perfect, right? Okay. So here's how it goes. I'm gonna let you pick the hat. You pick what hat you want. Check your heart. That one's for you. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Oh, this is a surfboard one. I like it. Okay, first we gotta put our hats on. This is a you don't wear makeup kind of day. I love looking at these girls from Destin because they're like, yep, I got it, I got you. This is kind of a dumb looking hat, I can tell. <laughs> I can tell. I don't know if it's gonna fit. Hold on, hold on. Oh, Amanda, take your shoes off. We, ju we just got off a boat, so we don't have our shoes on. Okay, so what we did is we, we were out on the boat, and then we pulled up at the boathouse because we decided we were gonna have some oysters. Okay, now, are we good here? Are my earrings on still? Do they, they actually match my hat, so that's really cool. Okay, shoes off. What else do we need? Music. We need music. Yes. Come on. This is what we sing on the Gulf Coast. Y'all can stand up. Get up. Get up. Get some exercise this morning. Sandy's from Alabama. She can sing the words. We have a special part for you that we want to teach you. Just keep it up, it's coming. We've ordered the oysters. We're waiting for them to come. There's some colorful people sitting next to us. Coming? Ready? Yeah, here we go. You guys gonna be ready to sing the chorus? Okay. 
sweet home Alabama. Roll Tide, roll. Sweet home Alabama. Roll Tide, roll. I, I don't even like Alabama. <laughs> Okay. All right, all right. You guys got it. You can sit down. Good job. Good job. Can you hear me? Okay, you're good. I really don't, don't like Alabama. Most people, most people in Destin don't like Alabama unless they moved from Alabama because it was vacation land. They decided to come live there. So here we go. Amanda, are you ready? Can I just ask you, how was married life? Do you love it? Oh, I'm so, I'm so happy for you. I love you. Okay, so have you ever done, you've never done this? Okay, so what happens is we shuck these babies. Oh. Does that, that, I don't know if I want that one. I am kind of picky about my oysters. These are all sweet. These, these are? Okay. Here we go. So I'm going to, look at that. Look at that. Okay. Here we go. So here's what we do. Now, I, normally I would say, like, don't, just don't even use a cracker, but we're going to use a cracker because we're trying our best to be kind to you. And so we're going to show you the way the, the way the tourists eat them. I usually just pop them in my mouth. Are you ready? You're going to be good. Okay. Mmm. Mmm. I'm good. Sandy, I want you to slurp yours. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sandy usually eats them steamed, but she's going to do raw today. It's on. Okay. And then I'm going to fix yours, Amanda. Are you scared? No. I, I can, you're good. It's good. Mm-mm-mm. There you go. That's like snot. It is kind of like snot. <laughs> um, but you, you just go with it. Mm. We need the music. I think it's time. It's time. Take this baby. Ah! Oh, celebrate! Good job, Amanda! Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Great job, girls. All right. That's the way to do it, y'all. I'm telling you. I'll take that hat off. So, woo! Well, that was fun. All right. So here's kind of the thing. <laughs> it's a really great picture of what a local will do, like how you really live in, in, your, in the location that God's put you in. That's the way we live, and it is so much fun. I love it. It's not very pretty, though. It's a little smelly, for real. This... It looks really refined, doesn't it? It's really beautiful. There's nothing in it. There's no life. There's no life in there. So I kind of just wanted to paint that picture for, for you guys so that we could understand that refined is not always this image or this thing that, um, that looks really, really great, but refined is actually being your unedited, raw self. That is what refined is. I love it. So, to bring a little Bible in it this morning, <laughs> um, uh, what we're going to do is I want to tell you a story about a woman who I kind of see she has this image or this view of the way her life should be because she comes from a really, really important family, and the promise of God is on her life. And she knows it. And um, I think there's a little bit of a struggle of how it is that, she, that stuff's going to play out. So I just wanted to bring that up. And her name, we're going to call her Rebecca the Precious Pearl Maker. Rebecca. Now, Rebecca was married to Isaac. 
and Isaac is Abraham's son. And there's a huge promise on their life that's supposed to happen through their lineage. And what happens with this family is basically God is going to show himself through the entire world eventually because we get down the generations to Jesus and us. Like this impacts all of us. And, and she, she knows it. She knows that this is going to happen, that she's a part, that's the family that she married into. But the problem was is that she was barren and she couldn't have children. And so... Isaac, who was a, a man of God, I mean, he got it. He went straight to the Lord and prayed, and God was faithful, and, and she became pregnant. So she's probably really excited, like really cute. She bought all the cute maternity clothes, you know, and she's like super excited again. I'm like, kind of like a princess because I'm Isaac's wife. So anyhow, what happens though is after a while, there's this struggle on the inside of her, and she doesn't know what's going on. And she starts crying out, she said, this is not the pretty picture of what I thought was gonna happen because there's this rumbling in her belly. And so she seeks God about it, and God reveals to her that actually she's having twins. And there's a little bit of um, kind of a struggle going on in there between two, almost like two kingdoms, right? These two kingdoms that are on the inside of her. And they're gonna struggle, and he says, but it's cool because in the long run, one of them, is really gonna be like this promised child and it's gonna be the younger one. Um, And the older one's gonna serve the younger one. So it is gonna kind of be a struggle, but you know, I'm gonna do my thing, like things are gonna happen. So she has the babies, she goes into labor and has the babies and Reuben, Reuben, um, Esau comes out first and he's red haired and hairy and that does not sound cute at all. But anyhow, um, I'm like, oh, that's good, that's interesting. So, but then Jacob is right on the heels of Esau, but not only that, he's holding on to his leg. And when you look up the name Jacob, I know some of us are like, it's supplanter. I'm like, what is supplanter? I don't know. Basically, it's a leg puller. He's a leg puller. Like, he probably pretends, maybe deceives a little bit. Like, that's the name he gets. And so I think it kind of plays into the story a little bit. So what happens is that um, Rebecca becomes a little bit protective over Jacob. You know, she favors him. She just thinks he's awesome. He's an inside boy. So maybe he cooks cookies with her or something. I don't know. But she really loves him. And she kind of makes it easy for him, I think. And I think we do that sometimes as moms. Like, it's so hard to watch our kids go through stuff. I think that's why there's so much helicopter parenting now, I can say that because I'm older and I'm not there, but like, it's, like you can see, it's just so different. And I, and I think that's what was going on there with, with her and Jacob. And Esau, um, Isaac really loved Esau. So, es- not Esau, yeah, Isaac, Isaac really loved Esau. I'm so sorry. So Isaac is getting old, and so he knows it's time to pray the blessing over Esau. So he tells Esau, hey, I need you to go out. I need you to go hunting like you do, and I want you to make my favorite stew, and you come back, and I'm going to pray the family blessing over you. Rebecca's freaking out because she knows that Jacob is the one who really is going to be the, the one who's going to carry on this, this lineage. And so she's like, oh, my God, this is not look good. What can I do? So she goes and she talks to Jacob, and she tells him that she wants him to go out and, cut, and, and kill some of their animals and make a stew while Esau is gone and come back, and she's going to dress him up and make him hairy and stuff and pretend, kind of like pretend, that like everything is good. And so he goes, that, that happens, Jacob is not happy about it at all, but he, he goes ahead and does what his mom says. And they go in, and Isaac sees him, kind of, smells him, <laughs> feels him, and he's questioning, are you really who you say you are? Are you sure that you're Esau? And he's like, yeah, I really am. Feel my arms, they're hairy. And so he ends up praying the blessing over him. Well, Esau comes back from the hunt, and he, he sees this has happened in that as the older child, he did not get the blessing, and he is so mad. Well, Rebecca is very concerned about her precious pearl, Jacob, and so she, she decides she's going to become the chief editor of the story, and she begins to edit the story a little bit more, and she's like, okay, here's the deal. We got to get you out of here because Esau is going to kick your butt. 
And the other thing is, I don't really like the way Esau's living his life. It's kind of crazy. Like he, he's like really into these Hittite women who are like, they're like festival girls. And I'm not really sure. <laughs> I'm not really sure about, I don't, I don't know how to handle it. I'm not really sure what that life is all about, but it's okay, like, because you're going to go hang out with my uncle, and, um, or your uncle, and, and you're going to marry one of those pretty girls from Pasadena. So it's all going to work out good. <laughs> you go ahead and leave. But the funny thing is, he goes, but I just, you know, this story is not about Rebecca. <laughs> Like, I didn't bring up this Bible story because of Rebecca. I brought it up because of you, and I brought it up because it's me, it's my story, it's your story, it's the battle that we have to, to kind of show the best of who we are. I think even as believers, it's, it's like you don't want people to like think that you're not mature Christian or something, and so sometimes there's some pretending, and then what ends up happening is in that is that you can sometimes become a little pretentious as a Christian, like people will look at you that way. And that is just not at all, I think, who, we, who we're supposed to be as Christ followers. I know you guys would agree with me. Um, I don't wanna be that person. And obviously, like I had to deal with this with this message, because like I said, I had this beautiful message and points and all of these things, and I forget my words, and Sandy has to remind me, and all of that. You know what, I'm not perfect. Like I can't do this thing perfectly. But I can tell you, man, I love God and I, with all my heart, and um, I just want him to use me. And I'm so honored to be here this morning. So I, I wanted to kind of give you guys some pictures of maybe the way these things play out in our lives practically. So um, here we go. Um, this is uh, your real life, okay? Okay, so you have, this is like who you are. Like this is where you're at right now. And thank God we like move from glory to glory to glory, right? Thank God. Um, so here's, here's your real life, but then over here is your ideal life. And that's that person, that's that promise that you know on the inside, like who God's created you to be. You know, it could be the person you know you want to become, that you can see that God has called you to be. It could actually be vision or dreams, um, things that you want to achieve. But in this, there's a big gap, isn't there? There's this line. And Jessica talked about this yesterday, is that there's a process, right? So there's this timeline that happens. So here's what we do. We go ahead, and sometimes we, we set goals. Like this is a healthy thing for you to do. Like this is a great practice. Here's where I am, here's where I need to be. And um, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna write, okay, I'm gonna set this goal. Uh, why'd you do that? No, that's scary. Um, <laughs> but in reality, that's what it ends up looking like. And you guys hate it. Especially those of you who are like really organized. It's like that is not the way things are supposed to be. And then you really work hard to try to get it back. And you can't get it back. It's very, very frustrating. Um, it's kind of like this pretty shell. When you guys saw these shells and you came in, I'm sure you thought that Jackie put them out because she wanted you to look at them and think, you girls are beautiful shells. You're beautiful and refined and gorgeous, and I just want to remind you how beautiful you are, Amanda Walker. I see you over there. But honestly, you really should be an oyster. You really should be an oyster. There's life in this thing. It doesn't even matter what it looks like on the outside. I was just thinking, I don't know if Carolyn is here this morning. Is she here? Carolyn Staubaum. Oh, I love you, Carolyn Stahlbaum. You are seriously, like, I'm not saying you look like an oyster, just so you know. Because um, you're beautiful. You're, so, you're just the cutest thing ever. But you are, you are that. Like, it's like there's so much life. It was so fun watching her get up here. And she's just, that girl is the most refined person I know because she just doesn't even care. So like, I'm like, never, I'm not Pastor Carolyn, and you know, I mean, she's so cute. And you guys were just laughing and having so much fun. She brought so much joy to your life. And you know, that's what real life is. That's what real life is, is really all about. So what I wanted to do too, is I wanted to give you a bit of oyster logic. You guys want some oyster logic? All right, here we go. So this is an unedited version 
of the oyster life. This is the way it's supposed to be. An oyster left alone, growing in its God-given purpose. In nature, oysters are basically filters of the environment. As they filter water, a small percentage of oysters produce pearls by covering a minute invasive object with nacre. Over the years, the irritating object is covered with enough layers of nacre to become a pearl. The many different types, colors, and shapes of pearls depend on the natural pigment of the nacre and the shape of the original irritant. Most pearls take at least two years to form. Got it? Okay, this is, in contrast, a cultured pearl. A cultured, cultured pearl is a man, man-made pearl. A cultured pearl is one that is manipulated by man for the purpose of marketing them. I know, yikes. Instead of an external irritant entering the shell as the oyster filters the water, a nice, neat cut is made into part of the oyster body. These are later harvested and sold, but they are not nearly as valuable as pearls that are created by nature. Isn't that the coolest thing ever? I just think that's so interesting. And really, the big point is, is that pretty doesn't make a pearl, pain does. An irritant. So you feel feeling ir- irritated with your friends or your coworkers or your husband or your children or with life. You're discouraged, you don't feel seen. I mean, all of these things, they become this irritant and we don't see them and people don't see them on the outside, but we know them. And, and we let them irritate us and every once in a while we might talk about it with somebody, but like we just wanna get rid of it. We just wanna get rid of it. But it's really, not, it's really something that should grow, you should grow through, because over time it's gonna produce a pearl in your life. But the thing is, is the pearl is not the goal. This is, so, uh, this is kind of like your message. The pearl is not the goal. The pearl is, is a monument, it's, it's a memorial. The pearl is just a memorial, a moment in your life that you can look back and go, wow, that was a really tough situation, but God did something beautiful with it. And as much as I hated it at the moment, I'm so glad I have a pearl to put around my necklace because it's so pretty, right? That's what a pearl's all about. So I I think I wanted to, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my story. Um, And this is just one of of jillions of stories at this point, but because it relates to, to this place, this house, I thought I would tell it. So I was 21 years old when I started coming to East Coast. And um, I was pretty, I would say a young believer. I had gotten saved as a teenager, but I was really beginning to um, allow God to do some things in my life. I was super hungry. And within months, I I fell in love with ministry. I fell in love with the church. And um, God, I just wanted to be a part of it, whatever I could do. And my husband switched a couple of jobs during the first couple of years of us living here. And most of it was around so that we we could actually build TNT. It was just... I'm gonna cry. Like, man, it was my life. Like, it was everything. I loved it. Like, do you see the space down here? Like, I explore the space during worship because because I can remember being down here with teenagers for years and years and years. It was so awesome. I loved every minute of it. And all I wanted to do was be able to spend my time doing that. So when my kids got old enough to go to school, I spent all of my free time while my kids were in school here at East Coast getting things ready for TNT every single week, planning. And I did that for years, years and years, for nothing. You know, I had no promise, neither did Eric, that we would ever be hired here. And honestly, I don't think we really cared. But as we were getting into it and things were growing, it was like, how do we do all of this? And so thank God they put me on the potty path, (laughs) right? Some of you who know what the potty path is. So I became a janitor here. And um, Jesus, y'all don't even know, this place is so clean compared to how it used to be. (laughs) Right, Carolyn? Uh, So anyway, I was on the potty path. I don't remember how many years it was. I think it was four years that I was on the potty path. And, um, and it just, the, the youth was growing at that time. Those of you who, were part, like, you just remember, like, it was crazy what God was doing. And um, I was trying to manage my family and trying to figure out all of that. So what I would do is I'd come and I'd clean and I'd try to do my best to get it done so that I would have at least an hour or two that I could get into the office and I could start working on some things with TNT. And um, I was in the bathroom, the really ucky bathroom next door. 
It's, it's been remodeled now, but who remembers the old pink nasty bathroom that did not have any ventilation in it at all? It was so gross. I think it was built in the 50s, I'm not kidding. And I remember being in there and just thinking, God, I hate this bathroom. I, I literally like would hold my breath the whole time I was in there. I hated that bathroom. And so I was cleaning that bathroom and I was in a stall cleaning and I just broke down. And I was like, I'm tired. I don't wanna do this anymore. When's it gonna change? I came out of the bathroom and I walked over to the vanities where the sink was and I looked in the mirror and I saw myself crying. And it was like Jesus was staring back at me. And he's like, I see you. I see you. This is important. What you're doing is important. And I don't know what happened that day, but I had a moment. Now that was not a memorial moment, that was an altar moment. That was a time where God completely changed my life and my perception about what the church was about, about what serving, what serving was about. It was an altar moment and he came and he met me there. The cool thing was, it wasn't soon after that, that um, things did open up for me, like within a moment it seemed like, and Eric told me, Pastor Dan wants to talk to you and I went in his office and, and um, he hired me as the office manager. It was like, like that. Uh, and believe me, you don't want me as your office manager. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, girls? I mean, here's the thing. I'm a, I am a bit of a pioneer. I can get in there and get some things rolling, but please don't ask me to maintain that stuff because it's just going to kill me. It will absolutely kill me. Oh, so where am I? I'm sorry I didn't plan to, um, to really cry through that. Oh, you know what we didn't do? I have a gift for you. Girls, you guys can go ahead and pass out those oysters. So while you're passing out the oysters... Don't anybody throw up. It's going to be amazing. I promise. You're going to love it. Do you guys remember that timeline I showed you? Here's what happens, and here's what happened at that moment. You have this idea of the way you think things are going to be, and then it turns out being not what you thought, and there's a squiggly line. But in that moment where you have that altar moment and God meets you there, I promise you he's going to make a piece of art out of it. He will make a piece of art out of it. And you just got to love it. It's abstract. You don't know what the heck is going on. <laughs> but it's a beautiful piece of art. I love those colors. Isn't that cute? I just love that. And honestly, that's what had to happen. That's what had to happen in my life. And uh, I'm so grateful that it did. I could tell you just so many stories where literally when I come back in town and I talk to Pastor Dan, I look at him and I go, I am so sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Because when you become a senior leader, you're like, your eyes are wide open and you, you have to see the big picture. I can remember having these moments. I'm telling you these stories, they weren't planned because you could, could pass these out. Is that good? I remember this moment where um, I had gone to this conference and seen Paula White preach, if you know Paula White. And she just loves like the community. And my husband, actually, it's so funny because our girls, some of our girls, girls don't really realize this because we don't have, um, our, we do outreach in a little bit of a different way. But Eric, like, he really did establish a lot of outreach things here at East Coast. And um, and so anyway, we went and learned from Paula White, and I came back and I was like, oh my God, we have to save the all of Merritt Island. Like, we got to get out in the project. We got to get this stuff done. And I remember talking to Pastor Dan, and I was like, and I'm gonna preach. You know, and I was like, and he just kind of sat there and looked at me. He's like, that's awesome. <laughs> awesome, Darlene. You know what? I, be I believe it. I believe it. But it might be for another time. I was crushed. I had to deal with that. That was painful. But I'm so glad he saved me from myself. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for your pastors who save you. I'm telling you what, guys, sometimes you just don't understand and when people are called to shepherd you and they really love you they see things in your life and they just they really just want to see God's best for you and and what, here's one of the things I love about Pastor Dan if he was wrong he'll come back and tell you he'll come back and tell you you know what I missed 
that one, and I'm really sorry. We had a couple of those kind of moments, you know. We have a great relationship. He's like a big brother. When Pastor Dan and I go out to eat somewhere, we always choose the same thing. It's so weird, you know. So I kind of like have these things. I just love him. I love him and Carolyn. So this is taking a little longer than I thought, but everybody needs to get one. Are you liking them so far? They're not smelly. I don't think. Can I just tell you that the girls at Shoreline Church made those for you? And y'all, listen. (laughs) It was not a pretty job. (laughs) They soaked in bleach behind the church for like at least a day, maybe two days. They got scrubbed up and they just made something beautiful out of them. And, and I, I want you to remember these because you, can put, you know you can put them on your dresser and put jewelry in them. They're so cute. Those of you who don't have them, you're like, what? Yes, I'm serious. You can. They're so cute. Okay. Now, before we go into the last part, once everybody gets an oyster, how are we doing on those oysters? Are we doing okay? Okay, good. You know what I have to tell you? This is really fun to tell you. That shell and snorkeling boat, it's fake. It's fake. Erica and I were like, I don't understand where they're, how are these people collecting all these shells? I know, you girls are laughing. We later found out that somebody goes out there with a bunch of shells and they drop them in the water for every tour. Y'all, listen, I know somebody who works on that boat and they knew that I was coming here to tell you this message and they were like, don't tell them I told you because I do not want to get fired. I'm not kidding. It's what they do. They take those shells and they put them out there because you don't find a shell in Destin. Like seriously, I probably have that many over a lifetime of shells that you find in the beaches. Although we have beautiful, beautiful beaches, shells are not the thing. Oysters are the thing. They are the thing. So once we get them all out, I have a little exercise. Are we doing okay, Jessica? Okay. Um, Yeah, I'm not even looking at the time. Oh gosh, we are running a little late. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and just start with this while you guys finish this up. These shells and the idea that the, the shells that were fake and the oysters, that whole refined, what is refined and what is unrefined Um, It reminds me that authentic, genuine experiences should remain unedited to truly experience the beauty that it produces. See, ultimately, Oyster's purpose isn't to create a pearl. So it really honestly isn't even about the pearl. The pearl is just a memorial. That's just a remembrance of the things that God has done along the way. But it has an extremely important environmental value. Oysters are a vital part of filtering the water around them. They suck in water and filter out the plankton. They swallow it, then they spit the water back out. And just one oyster can filter more than 50 gallons of water in 24 hours. That is ridiculous. Can you guys hold up your oysters? Okay. I want you guys to imagine that you are a reef of oysters. An oyster reef can increase and multiply its size and ability to filter water 50-fold, which also creates a thriving, healthy habitat for the sea animals to live. How amazing. Imagine that. And in Destin, there are beds of them everywhere. Do you see that? There's beds of them everywhere. I want you guys to imagine yourselves as a muddy reef where refinement isn't about living up to some kind of an image, but its purpose is to create an environment that is is attractive because we don't have to edit our own stories. Like we can actually show our crap, okay? It's okay to be ugly sometimes, it's okay. And the more refined we are, the more real we are, the more authentic we are, and the more free we are to actually be known. And what a beautiful place this would be, right? Do you see that? The reason it's like that is because there's oyster beds everywhere. I know, it's breathtaking. Can I pray for you guys? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think Psalm 139 is such a beautiful picture of us living authentically how God created us to be. So let's just, I just want to pray that over you and 
bless you. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here at East Coast Christian Center for this beautiful conference. And Lord, that you would love us enough to kind of show us where we're dirty, but you'd give us friends that would kind of share that dirty water and help filter it out for us a bit. And Lord, we thank you about all the ugly things that go on in our life, that you make something beautiful out of them. God, investigate our lives. Get all the facts firsthand. I'm an open book to you, even from a distance. You know what I'm thinking? You know when I leave, and you know when I get back. I'm never out of your sight. You know everything I'm going to say before I start the first sentence. I look behind me, and you're there. Then up ahead, and you're there, too. Your reassuring presence, coming and going. This is too much too wonderful. I can't take it all in. Investigate my life, oh God. Find out everything about me. Cross-examine and test me. Get a clear picture of what I'm about. See for yourself whether I've done anything wrong. Then guide me on the road to eternal life. God, we thank you for your word, that it's so powerful, and that you show yourself to us through your word. And Lord, we want to be more like you. We thank you for um, continuing to wash away the stuff so that we can be genuine and raw and give our unedited story in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys.